The Untold History, a podcast by the Hispanic Council with the collaboration of the Spanish Ministry of Defense to get to know great Spanish figures in the history of the United States. Today, Lucas Vasquez de Ayon. We frequently have the mental image of the explorer, pioneer, or Spanish conquistador as a lower-class youngster who, eager for adventures, fame, and fortune, embarks in search of a dream, feeling like he has nothing to lose. Oftentimes, it was not like that. Not in the case of Lucas Vasquez de Ayon, who, according to some of his contemporaries, never wore a cuirass, nor did he wield a sword. Lucas was therefore an atypical adventurer, and unfortunately for him and those who followed him, very unlucky. Lucas Vasquez de Ayon was born in Toledo in 1478 to a noble family of Mozarabs. At the time, Don Juan, Lucas's father, was the counselor of the Toledan capital. The first time we hear about his involvement in America was in 1506, the year in which he moved to the island of Hispaniola. He was named the Alcalde Mayor of Concepcion de la Vega, whose jurisdiction included the villas of Santiago, Puerto Plata, and Lares de Guajaba. He didn't begin his American journey as an explorer, but rather oriented toward increasing his wealth. Around 1510, he married, as his second wife, Ana Baceda, a daughter of a rich landowner, discoverer of gold mines, and rancher. Just like that, Lucas obtained lands in Puerto Plata, located in the north of Hispaniola, and dedicated his life to sugar growing, besides his judicial duty. His first non-judicial mission arrived in 1520, when he left for Mexico with an all-important task to mediate in the open conflict between Hernán Cortés and Cuba's governor, Diego Velázquez. Velázquez had sent Panfilo de Narváez, commanding an armada and 1,000 men, to stop Cortés. Our protagonist was trying to convince Velázquez of the folly of his determination without first informing the king of Spain. He was unsuccessful because Velázquez flatly refused to leave Cortés to his own will. Therefore, Ayon tried a different tactic, to follow Narvaez to Mexico, hoping that they could make amends by reaching an agreement without the influence of the governor. Those attempts were also unsuccessful. Once he reached Mexico, Lucas became a disturbing element for Narvaez's plans, as he was still manifesting his disagreement with the governor and his envoy. To make matters worse, he started to talk positively of Cortez. Narvaez took it badly so he ordered his imprisonment and sent him to Havana to Diego Velázquez. Ayon was not taken to Cuba, since during the trip, he made use of his powers as a judge. He bargained that if they were to take him to Cuba, he would condemn them to get hung in the gallows. On the contrary, if they took him to Santo Domingo, he would let them free. Such a display of judicial power must have been quite convincing as he managed to return to Hispaniola. From there, his reports that were favorable to Cortes were influential in achieving supporters in the metropoli. Cortes's achievement must have awakened the explorer inside Lucas, since from then on, his judicature and his business were left aside, as he focused most of his attention to his exploratory efforts. He was trying to become one of the protagonists of the Spanish expansion from the Caribbean bases. The first trip had his patronage and seal, but not his presence. In 1521, he chartered a vessel in partnership with two other entrepreneurs, captained by Francisco Gordillo, which landed in Florida and kept going north following the coastline. On its return, and after hearing the stories of the recently arrived, Vasquez de Ayon decided to thoroughly explore the lands discovered by Gordillo and start its colonization right afterwards. In this enterprise, he would not associate with his previous partners. As a man of the law, he chose the right path and went to Spain at the end of 1521 to capitulate before the crown. Besides the interest in the discovery and takeover of new lands, the crown also yearned for the discovery of the so-called, but non-existent, pass to the west that joined the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. 
With that in mind, they approved Lucas's proposition. Thus, on the 12th of June, 1523, the capitulation was agreed in Valladolid, commanding Vasquez de Ayon a double objective. On one hand, he had to explore the North American Atlantic coastside for 800 nautical leagues starting at the 37th parallel north, or until he found the longed for pass to the west. On the other hand, he had to cover inland the coastal area between the 35th and 37th parallels north. It was also agreed that the duty must be executed in three years. Two caravels with 70 men each, under the command of Pedro de Quexo, composed the first expedition. From Hispaniola, the ships went to already known places. The land and river of San Juan Bautista, landing in the river's mouth or nearby. From there, they went inland, exploring and making friends with the inhabitants of the territory. With that task completed, the caravels headed toward the north, in search of the long-desired strait, which of course they never found. Afterwards, they returned, no trouble, to their Dominican base. Soon after his comeback, Ion finalized the arrangements of a second expedition, oriented toward the colonization. Leading 500 settlers, Dominican doctors, and Frey's, Lucas began one of the most wretched chapters in the American conquest. The fleet set sail toward the previously explored locations, that is, the river named Jordan in nowadays North and South Carolina. From then on, it became a succession of misfortunes. It began with the loss of the captain's ship and all of the supplies it carried. Then the killing by the natives of 20 Spaniards who were sent in an expeditionary mission. Lastly, the Indians that they brought as interpreters fled, leaving the Spaniards' misfortunes and lacking the invaluable health of the locals. Despite all, they decided to keep going in search of a favorable place to found their colony. The chosen place was the estuary of another river in South Carolina that they named Guadalupe. It's believed that nowadays it's the Great Petey River, where they founded the colony San Miguel de Guadalupe. Here, the situation was still adverse. The area and its resources turned out to be insufficient to feed a population of over 500 people, more so accounting for the loss of the cloths and food that sunk along with the captain's ship. Between those hardships and the indigenous hostility, the settlement was slowly decimated. Even Ayon himself would meet his end. After falling sick, he died the 18th of October, 1526 the same day of his onomastic. It is possible that the passing of their leader was the final straw for the survivors, who decided to turn back. Not even their return would be uneventful, since their voyage met a storm that dispersed the ships. In the end, only 50 out of 500 expeditionaries made it back, most of them sick. They arrived in different zones of Hispaniola and Puerto Rico. They left a dream and a colony behind that, led by Lucas, was the first European settlement in North America. Whoa!